This program is brought to you in part by the Eugenie and Joseph Jones Family Foundation, a local foundation proud to support education, the arts, and culture in the greater New Orleans area. Hello, I'm Marcia Kavanaugh. Thanks so much for joining us. Well, sometimes there are two doses of reality for victorious politicians. The good news is that they are elected. The other news is that they now have to govern. Governor-elect Jeff Landry began the governing process this week by appointing advisory committees on different policy issues. Surprising among the selections was one to deal with the city of New Orleans. In Washington, another Louisianan has moved into a new office as Mike Johnson takes over as Speaker of the House. The reactions, like the Congress itself, have been divisive. We'll look at these stories as well as continuing risks for the Orleans Parish drinking water system, the latest on the fate of LEAP tests for Louisiana high school seniors, and new directions for Clearview. Joining us are this week's Informed Sources, Errol Laborde, producer of Informed Sources, Greg LaRose, editor of the Louisiana Illuminator, Don Ostrom, Channel 12's Future Watch reporter, and Jeremy Alford, publisher and editor, La Politics Weekly and The Tracker. We're going to stay with Jeremy right now because Governor-elect Jeff Landry has been busy. He's getting, uh, he's getting busy with selecting committees uh, for the transition, and he's really taken a look at several policy issues and then the surprise one of New Orleans. So tell us what's he up to so we're in the transition process uh th this happens every four to, to eight years we, we've been through a few of these the first governor uh, i covered was uh mike foster despite my boyish looks and I, <laughs> so i've been through a few of these and i was thinking today is like you know outside of that first year of a new governor you don't hear people often say oh yeah that's from the transition yeah, process that, right. Right. It's, kind of, it's kind of a dog and pony show but it's uh, a dog and pony show of the highest degree it's a real fancy schmancy dog and pony show where folks who contributed something to the election of the new governor Jeff Landry in this case uh, this is a part of their reward uh, some are transition chairs some are just members of the transition committees and uh, I was told uh, this morning that the folks who are actually serving on the committees, the rank and file members uh, started to, to be notified uh, Friday morning uh, that they would be serving on the different subject matter committees. So, you know, I, I, some big ones to watch, insurance and crime. Mm -hmm. Those are two special sessions that are, are gonna likely be called uh, right off the bat in 2024. Uh, but, you know, the, the one thing that isn't a dog and pony show is the fact that you know, New Orleans is, is being targeted in this transition process. Make no mistake about it. There's, in, in fact, there's an entire committee that's dedicated to nothing but the city. Uh, the chairman is the former owner of the, the penthouse apartment over at the, the Four Seasons, Boise mm -hmm. Bollinger. I think he sold it, though, and he's, he's just going to stay in He's looking at uh, He used to have a shipyard, too. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but but he's, he's looking at, at changes to the city, and, and, and the governor-elect says he wants the city to operate more like Charleston. Uh, he says he wants to sit down with local officials and, and talk to talk about law enforcement. And look, anybody who's been following the politics of Jeff Landry these yeah. last few terms of state government can't be surprised by this. Okay, some of the other policy, because you know, we're going to talk about New Orleans a little bit more. Errol's going to sort of dig us into that one. But um, some of the other policy issues that he's looking into, you, you know, you mentioned crime and, of course, insurance, other things that are... Uh, there, kind of there's an infrastructure committee that, that's, that's going to be looking at, at uh, a variety of different issues. Um, what, what are some of the education. other education? Education, of put course. Eddie Responi, who ran for governor against mm -hmm. John Bell Edwards, in charge of that committee, which is kind of a head scratcher. But again, it goes back to what you're saying about rewarding your significant contributors. Yeah, and so Eddie Responi is actually one of the the transition co-chairs. Mm -hmm. uh, and and so aside from from policy and education and all these other issues we're talking about, this is also a time where figureheads start to be identified. And there's a lot of folks who, who are going to want jobs in the Landry administration. Uh, they are starting to take applications for everything from big jobs like commissioner of administration down to, to internships. Uh, there's a lot of chatter already about uh, a former speaker, Teller Balra of New Iberia, the same corner of the world as Jeff Landry, 
uh, maybe jumping into one of those top jobs like commissioner of administration. Mm -hmm. Another candidate from the last gubernatorial cycle, uh, Ralph Abraham, a former congressman, mm -hmm. also a physician, uh, is one of the co-chairs as well. And I would imagine that he uh, is going to probably play some big uh, part in, in health care policy in, in the Landry, administra Landry administration. Landry's wife is also named. She's uh, the is only she going to head a committee? She's, she is the only woman that was named as a uh, co-chair of the, the transition process. Uh, I'm not sure what her role will be uh, throughout the, the, the transition process, but the first lady does have a, a lot of decisions to make, a lot to do uh, in regard to the governor's mansion. Usually they champion uh, a, a policy issue for, for Donna Edwards. It was human trafficking for Supriya Jindal. It was early childhood education, Alice Foster, it was litter. Uh, so we'll have to see what, what kind of role Sharon Landry wants to play. All right, so we have the committee heads. Who makes up the committee? Do the committee heads go ahead and select people, or is Landry involved in that selection? I think, I think there's, a, there's a lot of folks making decisions there. I mean, look, th there are a lot of people who helped Jeff Landry get elected in a lot of different ways. There are folks who did nothing but, but travel the state and gather information and pass it up the ladder, and they get a spot on the transition committee. There are folks who raised money. There are folks who gave money. There, there are folks who dropped out of races. Um, so, that, you know, th this is part of the way that a new governor says thank you to those folks, because those folks who are getting access to the transition process can then turn around and use that as leverage and capital in a number of different ways with clients, businesses, et cetera. And so how public will this process be? The committees, are they gonna meet in public? Are they inviting the public? Or are the committees gonna be meeting in private, releasing a report? What's the process like? I, I think we're, we're gonna have to wait and see. I think the actual meeting, the, the, the actual sausage making is, is probably gonna be somewhat private. Uh, I think we're going to see reports at the end of the process. I do know that some of the folks who orchestrated the transition process of John Bell Edwards did the same in a consulting basis for Jeff Landry. So we're going to see some of the same kind of outputs that we saw uh, eight years ago. Okay. And so, uh, as Jeremy mentioned, um, New Orleans has its own committee. And I know you want yeah, to talk about that. Yeah, that was a big surprise. That. I don't think it's ever been done before. There was a special task force uh, uh, to look at... at, at at New Orleans. And, and you know, one comment that Landry made was that we, we need to make New Orleans more like Charleston and Nashville. Well, that raised some questions right there. I mean, those are both fine cities in their own way. Uh, they both have a, a lot of character. I, I do know that uh, Charleston is a little bit like the Garden District, at, at least the most prominent of them in terms of the, uh, the, the architecture. Uh, I spent a few days there a few years ago, and a friend of mine pointed out that he did too. He said, the one thing, Errol, there's no music. I said, what? He said, there's no music in Charleston. We went around, we tried to find uh, music places. I said, well, that's in New Orleans, there's plenty of music, okay? And I've seen surveys of like, read the surveys of travel magazines ranking the top cities in, in, in the United States. And invariably, New Orleans is number two and Charleston is number one. So I've wondered, well, what is it about Charleston that New Orleans doesn't have? It, what Charleston has is an ocean, all right? Because uh, like seven miles outside of Charleston, you have the Atlantic, you have a really beach community. Mm -hmm. So you have this combination of a quaint city and then a uh, 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 beachfront and all that. And so I think it has all that, and, and plus it's on the East Coast, so there are a lot of people uh, that go there. It's also very clean. What? It's a, yeah. it's a very clean city. It, it is. It, it is. Uh, well, if you don't have any music, if you don't have any second lines, <laughs> if you don't have any parades, if you don't have Could any, uh, if you don't have any more, Nashville and has a lot of music there, yeah. okay, right. mm -hmm. and so there's, uh, there's no doubt about that. Uh, governmentally, though, um, Charleston has a, a strange government. It's a strong mayor council form of government, but the mayor is part of the council in, in addition to being mayor, and the mayor presides over the meetings and gets a vote. Now, imagine in New Orleans. <laughs> over the last wow. year or so, <laughs> if the mayor got to preside over the council meetings when they were trying to close the, uh, the place in the Pantalva and, yeah. and it, I mean, all, all the issues that have been, been named at the mayor. Nashville has something that reminds me a little bit of what, what, what uh, Baton Rouge has, where it's a president council sort of thing, where the, uh, where the outlying districts are included in the parish and in, in that same administration. I can't tell you one is better than the other. I can tell you that in the years there have been reforms to the New Orleans form of government. The big was, was in 1954 when they overhauled it and they went away from the old type of state-enforced government to a, a city charter. And that's when we got the city council that we have now with seen at the time as being a more of a modern type of government. And then after Katrina, there was a little bit of cleaning house that people um, looked at New Orleans government. For, for example, we had eight assessors. You say, why do you need eight assessors now, okay? 
and they combined that in one assessor. We had a, a separate criminal and, and, and civil uh, system, and they combined those in many ways. And so it's been overhauled in, in many ways um, over the years. But uh, I guess ultimately it's a, uh, it's a personality test of the city. But it wasn't really specific what criticisms they had, but, you know, well, surely there's, there are things to be found that are wrong. You know? you know, and Mayor Cantrell, I found interesting, came out and said that she would basically embrace it in a spirit of cooperation with the governor-elect to see what exactly has planned. Uh, city council leadership has not really said much about it, uh, but you might recall that uh, as AG, Jeff Landry, sitting on the bond commission, tried to get money held back from New Orleans for their major infrastructure project at the sewage and water board, which ultimately Treasurer Landry sort of stood in the way of. Uh, but yeah, there's not a lot of love lost mm -hmm. between yeah. the incoming governor and the current leadership. And you know, historically, the state has had a lot of influence in city government, even before, more so before the city charter. Before the city charter, if there was a vacancy like in the judgeship, the governor appointed, mm -hmm. uh, filled that judgeship. And so the city charter gave the city a little bit more independence, but there are a lot of boards uh, that is subject to appointments from Baton Rouge. And so Baton Rouge has a pretty heavy hand in New Orleans, too. So Boise Ballinger is going to head that committee. Um, and who's going to be on that committee? Any idea who he's um, going to be appointing, as I, he said? I am, I am told that those members were notified uh, Friday morning, so we should be, mm. be hearing those names. I'm surprised no one has mentioned Huey Long and his, his use yeah. of the National Guard to, to yeah. <laughs> force his will mm -hmm. on New Orleans. Yeah, it does kind of uh, hark back to those days. Uh, there was a time one time when there was actually a war between New Orleans and the state government uh, right outside of Gallia Hall. The city people, the police were in, in Gallia Hall, state police from that building across the street, and it was about documents and records. And so there's been different kind of relationships. But yeah, there were times when the state really kind of okay. controlled New Orleans. We'll see where this all moves along. Thanks a lot, guys. And okay, all over to Dawn right now, because what's happened over at what we've known for years and years is Clearview Shopping Center, but it's different now. Clearview Shopping Center opened in 1969. Very traditional shopping mall with the big box stores centered around. It's now Target and the AMC Theater. It used to be Sears. Where Sears was, uh, most of us know, was knocked down and in, in February of this year reopened as a 210,000 square foot medical facility uh, known colloquially as the Oshner Super Clinic. Um, care for men and women and all sorts of different care. Um, some med day surgeries. It is a super clinic. The doctors I know who work there have really enjoyed the facility, the patients too, that access right there to an Oshner facility right at Clearview. But the shopping center itself, that whole area has been recoined the Clearview City Center. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea is, I'm going to try to give you a little visual, it's like mm -hmm. two half moons with, in the middle of those crescents, it's going to be ponds and green space and it's all outdoor and on one end of one crescent you've got Target and on the other end of the other crescent you have the movie theater and what's in between it all will be knocked down to make it open air with leasing for new stores and restaurants and some of what's there is staying there's more to come but there is room tons of space that property is 35 acres the redevelopment is 425,000 square feet of retail hospitality and entertainment including also the uh, apartments, the, the metro at Clearview. The metro mm -hmm. at Clearview is 270 different one, two, and three bedroom apartments. The original publication said that they would be ready in February of next year. That date's been pushed back till May. Construction always takes longer than right. you think. They're currently collecting a list of people interested in, in leasing those apartments. The whole idea is to have it be a place where you work, play, live, shop, do it all. Um, they've also acquired, part of Clearview City Center has acquired 4230 Veterans Boulevard, which is the home of the new Ruby Slipper. If anybody's eaten at the Ruby Slipper, there's also a daiquiri shop there. That's now known as the Commons at Clearview City Center. Um, and if you take a drive by it, you'll see a little more landscaping, a little more green space, a little more places to sit outside, a little less just brick and mortar right up against the roadway and concrete parking lot. So the idea is to make places kind of feel better when you go mm -hmm. to them. So it's in the, in the process of being redeveloped. They're still trying to make the plan for what will happen in what was the Bed Bath & Beyond. Um, that's not just because of Clearview City Center, it's because of Nationwide, the Bed right. Bath & Beyonds have gone under and sort of come back uh, with a different name. Um, it was most recently, as we all know and love, the, super, the Spirit Superstore for 
the recent. Th uh, so Target's the most important shopping. <coughs> Target <area. laughs> is Target is the most important shopping area that we all know of in mm -hmm. that center, and at least Clearview City Center says it is the first in the nation in terms of sales per square foot. It really? is an always busy oh. Target. Target says they don't release that kind of information to the media. Clearview City mm -hmm. Center says it is first in the nation sales per square foot. That the city center itself had four million visitors last year. It's perfectly housed. Uh, with 260,000 households and less than a 20-minute drive from it. There is no Target in the city of New Orleans, so it's the closest Target for New Orleans. And, and uh, so the residential, that's going to go back where that whole the, parking area? The residential, is going if, you're, if you are driving inbound on veterans um, and Target's on your right and then the super center's on your right, the the apartments are kind of back behind that, between the service mm -hmm. road and where the movie theater well, if is. If you were ever in a Metairie Mardi Gras parade, mm -hmm. that's where they have traditionally staged all of right. the floats between the shopping center and the service road. But the uh, apartments are two or five-story structures with two courtyards, pool, fitness room. They should be. So it sounds like a whole new village. A whole created new village. Yeah. In, in the docks, there is no. Don't think of it as a small emergency care. No, place. it's <laughs> a very large. Two hundred and ten thousand yeah. square feet yeah. is is it's, not It's a mini tiny. hospital. Yes. Yeah, full and scale. Yeah. Hopefully, they find a place for Santa. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I said Santa. before the show, my, my favorite mall Santa ever with children here was the yeah. Clearview Santa. My kids don't really indulge me in that anymore. <laughs> However, he was awesome. Okay. All right, Don, thanks a lot. Greg, let's go back on over to you because sure. you guys had a piece in the Illuminator about the intake, the water intakes for Orleans Parish, which it's a problem. Yeah, so everyone was sweating the salt water right. intrusion. Turned out to be not such a big deal, but it obviously put focus on how the city on both banks gets its water, and there are two intakes on each side. And this is all available, amazingly, on in public records that are accessible from the Sewage and Water Board online for the most part. Some of them we did um, request. And there were some elisions, the term for when a vessel hits something stationary on the river, twice on the East Bank. And for reasons we're still trying to figure out, one of the intakes on the West Bank has been inactive since at least 1989. So you have just one intake on the West Bank. It's protected by barges on and off. And we say on and off because seasonally with the rising water levels, those barges have to be moved. So uh, there are these metal structures they call dolphins that are sticking out of the water and typically placed along, right in front of the intakes and as well as screens and such. And we're told by the Sujan Water Board that the engineering and keeping place, this, uh, keep in mind, this project goes back years, if not you know, close to a decade. The engineering alone is not yet complete, almost complete, but not complete. So if you looked upriver at Jefferson at their protection, you'd find dolphins, you'd find concrete, you'd find really extensive measures to keep the intake safe. Uh, that's not there in New Orleans. So we're basically another accident away potentially from losing these intakes. Okay, so there are four intakes all told? Two on each side. Two on each side, and on the West Bank, there is no backup? There's only now just, just one. one. It, okay. Should the one working um, intake go down, there's a 24-hour water supply for the entire West Bank. Now, that's not too bad, actually, because should something happen on in Jefferson Parish and mm -hmm. certain areas, the water supply is only about four five, six hours, hmm. uh, which was like, wow, really? really? But they have really, really good protection for their intakes. Okay, so Orleans Storage and Water Board, what are they doing about this? Well, they pointed to just a lack of financing to get this done, and it you know, falls along line with everything else. You know, these things cost money, but uh, they've known about it for some time. They've had an insurer come in and do a consultant uh, report on it and say that, yeah, that this is a pretty high risk situation that should be addressed. Definitely, you all have a great piece on it. So to really go in depth into it, go to the Louisiana Illuminator. A really, really good piece that Thank was you. done on it. All right, Jeremy, over to you. Mike Johnson, how's he doing as Speaker of the House? You know, he hit the ground running. It was interesting the, the, his first day of being elected, the national media were, 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 were very uh, gentle with him. They, I think they were impressed by the shiny new thing in the House <laughs> yeah. and, and how it happened. That we had a House Speaker. It was speaker. different it was a and it, he's yeah. kind of neat. And, but by the next day, they had questions about everything from his children to, to his like, uh, to a former uh, Christian law center that was going to be in northwest Louisiana. Uh, but he has had to hit the ground running. There, there's a handful of appropriation bills that, that needed immediate attention. Uh, there's there's a, an appropriations package for Israel that's on the move. 
Uh, he is in talks with the Senate about a standalone package for, the, for Ukraine. I believe there are some things that the House wants to see before that package is going to move, so there may be a bit of horse trading mm -hmm. on, on that money. Uh, but I, I guess most notably, there's a continuing resolution in about a week and a half, a couple of weeks, I think, mid-November, that's going to need to be voted on. And Continuing resolution impacts whether this, or not there's a shutdown. That's right. The, the, this is the, the legislative instrument that allows lawmakers to avoid a partial shutdown of the, the federal government. Um, Mike Johnson has told colleagues in, in, in writing um, that he uh, will either move to, to push that continuing resolution to January or April. Uh, I find the, the January idea kind of humorous because that is Washington Mardi Gras at the end of the month and the last thing revelers want to do is, is to be partying while the government has a partial shutdown. That's not a great look. Um, so maybe April, we'll see. But uh, he has formed a number of, of different working groups on appropriations bills uh, that I think law, lawmakers were eager to see happen, uh, particularly on the, uh, the, the, I think it's the food and farm bill, appropriations bill, there, there's a new working group. Uh, so, you know, the, the, there's a lot of politics and, and he's hit the ground running, but I think that the true tests are yet to come. The one thing that kind of surprises me, and most of the issues I can understand one way or the other, but his having been so active as an election denier and actually working with the Trump people. Do you think he really believed in that or was he just trying to get on the good side of Trump? I mean, it's very, it's clear that at one point he was a huge believer in it. And uh, it, it was interesting it, it, when, when word was kind of delivered to, to reporters in a press conference about this, that question was asked. And Mike Johnson kind of shook his head and I believe one woman, uh, Congresswoman actually told a reporter to shut up. Yes. Yeah. Um, and, and so that no one wanted to talk about that. They wanted to focus on, on moving forward and not what's behind, but that most certainly is something that is behind, yeah. Okay, there's nothing easy that's going through Congress these days, that's for sure, but I mean, what sort of the sentiment are you, you hearing about of other Congress members toward this new speaker, toward Mike Johnson? I think everybody's just, just waiting to see how this is gonna shake out. I, mean, I think no matter who would have been elected speaker, they're facing the, the, the same mm -hmm. challenges that Kevin McCarthy faced. Um, you know, when you see someone like a Steve Scalise, who, who is a fighter, who's a bulldog, take a step back from this process. Step, take a step back from the opportunity to be in, in the lineage uh, or the line of succession for, for president. You have to, add, to wonder what's really going on in that chamber. And it, it seems to be uncertainty uh, that is kind of in the, the wake of chaos. It, what I find interesting is that the speaker's role has typically been for the party in charge, a real key cheerleader for fundraising. Yeah. And that is not something that Johnson really has in his wheelhouse. Uh, so I, he, it, as I, my take on it is that, like, look, they're just happy to have someone in there that, you know, read not Jim Jordan, that can actually move things along and not have yeah. a terribly contentious relationship with Democrats and within, the own, within their own party. So p just from a political perspective, I, you know, I, I think folks should be less worried about that than, than other issues yeah. because to become speaker traditionally, you had to have that, that fundraising mm -hmm. prowess. But Mike Johnson never had that. And he was never expected to become speaker in, until recently mm -hmm. here. But now that he is speaker, I think that fundraising turns on. I mean, Good he's point. still the speaker. Yeah. He still has the big gavel. So I, I think he'll take to it. Okay. Of course, Louisiana now has one and two in terms of GOP leadership in Congress, in the House. That's right. That's right. Yeah. We also have two appropriators. And John Kennedy on the Senate side and Julia Letlow on the House side. It, we have never had yeah. a stronger delegation in yeah. D.C. than we do now. And, right. and we have a Supreme Court seat. Yeah. That's true. Okay. All righty. All right, guys, thanks. Greg, we're going to wrap it up with you now. And then talking about LEAP, uh, the LEAP test and graduating seniors. Some want to change it a bit. Others say no. Yeah, so the Board of Elementary and Secondary Education voted in June to give high school seniors an option if they failed the LEAP test. You could appeal and basically appeal to your principal or superintendent and say, look, I've got a great GPA, I've got all this going for me, just can't <coughs> pass that darn LEAP test. And what they approved was essentially that path towards an alternative to LEAP. Uh, fast forward to last month, the House Education Committee rejected that proposal. And again, it was very contentious. It was only a 6-5 vote in Bessie, uh, but the Republican-dominated Education Committee shot it down in an 8-3 vote. Governor Edwards came out this week and said, I'm snubbing the committee vote. Let's let that policy roll through. Now, at the end of the day, 
you have a change in administration, mm -hmm. an even more heavily Republican dominated legislature that is going to you know, take office before the next go round of leap tests. So we're probably gonna end up without this alternative that Cade Brumley opposed and many Republicans. The state superintendent yeah, yeah. opposed it. So what can students do now, real quick? So right now they're basically windows to take the leap test as a senior. Uh, if you fail it in April, you can take it in May. If you fail it in May, then you can be placed into uh, the December window. There are some summer leap tests for the lower grades, but yeah, essentially you don't have what amounts to the official high school diploma of Louisiana if you're not passing it. And uh, the latest figures show about 16% of Louisiana high school seniors don't pass mm -hmm. that leap test. That Which subject matter do they have to take as seniors, do you know? English, uh, math, I think a couple versions of math, uh, history, um, yeah, there, there are four sections of it that they have okay. to pass individually. Right. And cumulatively that they, uh, they're not all taken then senior year, 16. they're sometimes taken earlier. Yeah, yeah they, they, they roll through the process. So right now the governor says that there is an appeals process, but come January we don't really know. Yeah, that's e exactly. Okay. The governor-elect who's come out against this is, you know, could okay. very well decide along with, uh, you know, another legislative committee. Right. All righty. Time for other stories. Eat over to you. Well, if it's November, it's almost carnival time. And, you know, the big issue carnival's been facing it lately is the... Uh, is paying for police. So a couple of years ago, they had to actually shorten the routes because they're not having enough police manpower. It was a big issue last year, but, but at the meeting of the uh, Mayor's Mardi Gras Advisory Committee, the, the city administration seemed to be confident they can cover it. Uh, we have a shortage of police, but they have enough money to bring in enough police to, uh, to do it. So for right now, they seem like they're okay for this carnival. Okay, Greg. We've partnered with WVUE Fox 8 on another story about the Sewage and Water Board. This looking at the employees who go around the city testing for the presence of coliform and chlorine that mm -hmm. would actually kill it. And based on data, we've found GPS and what they're turning over to the state health department. Uh, bottom line, they're not doing their jobs. Uh, disciplinary mm -hmm. action has already been taken against two of these, and we're continuing to dig deeper. Those stories will air Tuesday and Wednesday night on Fox okay, 8. Okay, great. We'll be looking for that. Dawn. Just a quick reminder that we set our clocks back on Saturday night, and that means the evenings will be much darker, so mm -hmm. be careful on the and streets. Soon. It's going to be yeah. dark at 5 o'clock. It will be right. dark, and kids and dogs and late night or evening joggers will be out there, so yeah. keep, extra keep caution. Keep a look out. All right, Jeremy, over to you. Seven non-consecutive days of early voting started Friday morning for the November 18th election. Secretary of State Kyle Ardoin saying 15 to 18 percent turnout. Really low. Oh, really low. November 18th. November 18th. General election. All right, guys, thanks so much for being here. Thank you all for joining us, and we'll see you again next week for Informed Sources. Have a good evening. This program is brought to you in part by the Eugenie and Joseph Jones Family Foundation, a local foundation proud to support education, the arts, and culture in the greater New Orleans area.